Wait, 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 wait. Operation Tarzan. Like, 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 like Tarzan, like the books and the movies. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. No, wait, wait. What does it involve? No, no, no. Stop. Stop. No, don't tell me. It's called Tarzan. It's going to be good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. See you. Yeah. Bye. December 10th, 1943. Over the past month and a half, I've talked about the Allied plans in Italy, those of 5th Army advancing up the West and those of 8th Army advancing up the East, but there's actually a third attack point in the works. Yep, and there kinda has been all along. And now a word from Time Ghost. And since it's Christmas season and you're probably thinking about what you can surprise your neighbors and your friends and your loved ones with, check out our merch store because we've got some really cool new stuff and you'll not only make everyone really happy, you'll also be supporting us. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, a German air raid against Bari released a secret Allied stockpile of mustard gas. There was a big American media scandal about General Patton's August slapping incidents. President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill met with Joseph Stalin in Tehran, and in the field, the Allies were on the move in Italy, but the Soviets were being held back in the USSR. Here's what follows. Well, first of all, after leaving Tehran, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill meet again this week in Cairo, the 4th to the 6th, for a second Cairo conference. Dwight Eisenhower is now appointed to command next spring's Operation Overlord, a cross-channel offensive, with no intermediate command between him and the army groups on the continent. Sir Henry Wilson will be in charge of a consolidated Mediterranean theater. And after a fair amount of pressure, Roosevelt reverses his previous stance that was in favor of Operation Buccaneer, an amphibious operation against the Andaman Islands to cut off the Japanese line to Rangoon, and is now in favor of sort of a downgrading of the China-Burma-India theater because of a delay in operations in Burma and a stronger emphasis on the Pacific approach to Japan. Churchill is trying to persuade people that Joseph Stalin's Soviet commitment to joining the Pacific War once Germany is defeated reduces the importance of actively involving China against Japan, and that allocating force for Buccaneer would endanger Overlord. U.S. Army Chief of Staff George Marshall, though, says that if they cancel Buccaneer, then Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek won't send Chinese forces for Operation Tarzan, an offensive in the northern Burmese jungle, and that will have repercussions for the Pacific. Then, for the first time in the war, Roosevelt decisively overrules Marshall and says Buccaneer is off. There's a lot going on here. Vinegar Joe Stilwell already has two Chinese divisions crossing the Chindwin River to hopefully take Michina and reopen an overland route from Burma to China. Roosevelt going back on his earlier agreement with Chang about Buccaneer means Stilwell is now going to be trying this with no help from the Chinese Nationalist Army. As for Chang, he had been provided with the excuse he wanted to avoid reopening the major land conflict with the Japanese. This suited his long-term intentions of continuing the unofficial truce with the imperial forces occupying China's eastern provinces. Because as long as his nationalist army was avoiding the main struggle, it could build up its strength with American equipment for the day when Chang had to settle old scores by moving to suppress Mao Zedong's communist forces entrenched in the hills of Yan'an. The Chinese economy as you may imagine, is a wreck at this point. There's a lot of corruption and, and inflation is enormous. Chang, in the wake of Roosevelt's reversal, asks the US for a billion dollar loan and Lend-Lease supplies increase to 10,000 tons a month. Henry Morgenthau, US Secretary of the Treasury, flat out says no to even proposing the loan to Congress. Goodwill towards Chang might be running out. But as they discuss plans in Cairo for future fighting, there's plenty of actual fighting going on this week. 
In Italy, the Americans reached the top of La Defensa last week, though the fighting after that was vicious. They have managed to hold on to it though, and by the 6th have pushed on and taken Hill 907 below Monte Camino. That mount also falls this week after five intense days of fighting to the British. The fighting on this front has gotten more and more bloody, and that is going to continue without a doubt. Rick Atkinson writes of Camino, the hospital admission list ran to 40 pages and the diagnoses summarized life on the winter line. Gunshots, mortar fragment wounds, cerebral concussions, fractures and sprains, grand lacerations, amputation, right thumb traumatic, contusions, nervous exhaustion, jaundice, severe diarrhea, pewter burns, hemorrhoids extremely severe. Still, with Monte Maggiore and Rotondo also having been taken, both sides of the entrance to the Mignano Gap are in allied hands and phase two can begin. Mark Clark is going to attack Monte Samucro and San Pietro with a right hook. The morning of the 7th, the Americans manage to climb and take Samucro despite determined counterattacks. It is not so at San Pietro. There are well-constructed defenses here. The olive tree fields are mined, and German artillery has an unobstructed view of the American ranks from Monte Lungo to the west. The attackers are driven back to their starting points. This happens again the 8th, and realistically, until those German gunners are driven from Monte Lungo, San Pietro will be out of reach. To be fair, the Americans do hold the southern part of Lungo. It is then that the first Italian motorized group is tasked with taking the rest of it. And this is the first Italian action for the Allied side in the war. It does not go well. The Germans are very well entrenched, and German machine gun crossfire is brutal, and Lungo, and thus San Pietro, remains in German hands. Now, I've talked about the overall Allied plan here in Italy, but there is one aspect I have not covered yet. See. 8th Army is to reach Peshara and then swing left towards Rome from the east. 5th Army is to break the Mignano Gap, cross the Rapido River, reduce Monte Cassino, and then advance in the Liri River Valley to Frosinone, like 50 kilometers from Rome. Right. But there is a third force that is planned to reach Rome with those two, or even possibly before those two. I mean, Allied planners this whole autumn have been working on a way to reach Rome without endless mountain climbing. Eisenhower has long thought that an amphibious end run around Rome would so threaten the Germans that they would maybe abandon their defenses south of the city. It would have to be done by at least one division, and better would be two, but a real issue is landing craft. I've talked before about the landing craft debate and that Ernest King, who has like three quarters of the Allied landing craft, wants them in the Pacific. But even beyond that, most of Eisenhower's craft have been scheduled to go to Britain by now to be used in training for next year's Normandy invasion. And that didn't leave time enough to plan and execute such an amphibious move. Italy has a really low priority, but command here just couldn't just let go of an idea that seemed so attractive. It wouldn't necessarily be easy. I mean, they'd have to land close enough to their main force so they could link up with them pretty quick to avoid being trapped on the beachhead and wiped out. But, but still, so Eisenhower had asked for, and been given, permission to keep 56 British and 12 American LSTs until December 15th. That's been extended to January 15th. But that's now the whole plan for 8th Army, 5th Army, and an amphibious force to all converge on Rome. And it might be grandiose, and it might be a stupendous undertaking, but it was necessary to keep pounding at the Germans, to keep them off ballots, to deny them time to build more formidable fortifications. If the Germans were allowed to become impregnably entrenched, they could release several divisions from the Italian front and send them to Russia or Normandy. The basic aim of the Italian campaign was now to prevent this. If the campaign was to achieve such an objective, a gamble had to be made while the Mediterranean commanders still had the resources, however slim. And in both the west and the east of the Italian peninsula, they are sure trying to plow ahead. On the 6th, 8th Army reaches the river Moro. 
This is the beginning of the Moro River campaign. Four infantry divisions, one Canadian, one Indian, one from New Zealand, and one British, are the attackers. They are backed by British and Canadian armored brigades, and they are to hit the heavily fortified German positions north of the Moro River. The Canadians are given the lead here and make big assaults at three points, hoping to secure a major bridgehead. They attack Via Rogatti already at midnight, occupying it just before dawn. An attack on San Leonardo actually began late the 5th, but the heavy fighting on the 6th fails to take it. An attack on San Donato near the coast the afternoon of the 6th also fails to take its objective. The fighting for San Leonardo and San Donato is renewed the 8th, and Canadian engineers managed to complete a bridge over the Moro the 9th, allowing them to bring up tanks. By noon, they have cleared San Leonardo of the enemy, who is pulled back to a second defense line, known as the Gully by the Canadians. During all this, the New Zealanders attack Orsonia the afternoon of the 7th. They have a British parachute brigade backing them, as well as aerial and artillery support. And they do make good initial progress and fight their way to the center of the town. But by the evening, it's clear they can't go further without armored support. But hidden minefields and entrenched German armor make that a non-starter, and they withdraw from the town the morning of the 8th. Since these attacks have all stalled, the Indian 21st Brigade is ordered to try and reach Caldari. This involves building a bridge across the Moro backwards from the enemy held bank of the river because of the local geography. Once the impossible bridge is completed the 9th, armor comes across and they expand their bridgehead. Fighting for the gully, a ravine that's like 60 meters deep, begins today when it's attacked by units of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade. They do take the ridge south of the gully, but are unsuccessful in overcoming the enemy by the end of the week. There are unsuccessful Allied operations as well this week in the Soviet Union. I already mentioned last week that the Soviet Western Front's Orsha Offensive is called off now on the 5th. It has been a frustrating couple months in the center for the Soviets overall. For maybe 10 kilometers of ground, they've taken not much under 100,000 casualties, around 30% of the front's strength. That front has also lost 177 tanks. In the wake of the Western Front's frustrating defeats in November, the Stavka apparently gave up on its hopes of smashing Army Group Center by means of hammer blows delivered against the latter center, specifically the defenses of the 4th Army in the Orsha and Mogilev regions. The Stavka decided to shift the full weight of the Western Front's strength northward so that it could join the advance of General Bagramian's 1st Baltic Front on Vitebsk. In the meantime, it ordered General Rokossovsky's Belarusian Front to expand its offensive from the Gomel region towards Rechitsa and provided him the forces necessary to do so. Therefore, a concentrated effort to envelop and destroy Army Group Center was in the offing. Konstantin Rokossovsky's Belarusian Front holds the big gap between German 9th and 2nd Armies. He still wants to accomplish the task Stavka has given him, taking Bobruisk. He knows that to do this, he'll first have to beat the strong German defenses coming out of Kalinkovici. It will not be easy, especially after the 9th, when Stavka transfers a bunch of his units to Nikolai Vatutin's 1st Ukrainian Front near Kiev. But Rokossovsky has already begun his offensive by then, sending in Pavel Batov's 65th Army the 8th. However, by the end of the week, they have made very little ground, save a small salient carved in the enemy defenses and reaching the outskirts of Ubolot. Further south, however, it is the Germans who are making the big gains this week. The Axis attacks towards Kiev that have been gearing up for the last two weeks go off this week. Units from Erhard Rauss's 4th Panzer Army plan to eliminate the Soviet salient and give the Wehrmacht a better front line. And this they actually fully managed to achieve. From starting points west of the Zhidomir Korsten Road, they break out across the road the morning of the 6th. They quickly overrun the enemy before them, driving through the Soviet 60th Army and even taking its headquarters in the afternoon though its commander, Ivan Cherniakovsky, manages to escape. In fact, the Germans advance nearly 35 kilometers that day and keep up the advance for another three days. 
Finally, with no further clear objectives in range, Balk and Raus called a halt to the attack. The Soviet 60th Army had suffered significant losses, and while the haul of prisoners and captured tanks and guns was perhaps modest, the threat of a Soviet drive towards Zhitomir from the northeast had been eliminated. So the new front line runs north and then turns west along the Irsha River and then north again to east of Korstein. Balk, that's Hermann Balk, commander of 48th Panzer Corps, has recon that says the Soviets are strong near Melanie, southeast of Korstein, and he plans to attack them next week with a pincer movement and surround what he can of them. Even further south along the line, the mud is finally over and the frost has come, and with it, the hardening of the ground that allows Pavel Rutmistrov's armor to head out again, and the Soviet 5th Guards tank army takes Znamenka on the 10th. The Allies are also attacking halfway around the world in the Pacific, but at sea and in the skies. On the 4th, in the Marshall Islands, six U.S. carriers and nine cruisers attack Kwajalein, sinking six Japanese transports and damaging two cruisers, and also shooting down 55 planes while losing just five of their own. On the 8th, Kwajalein is hit again, this time by five battleships and 12 destroyers with two carriers for air cover. They damage a destroyer. Also on the 4th, in Japanese home waters, the escort carrier Chuyo is sunk by an American submarine. And on the 9th in the Solomons, the newly built American airfield at Cape Torokina on Bougainville is operational. The first planes arrive the 10th. There is also Allied action in the skies over Europe. Operation Crossbow begins bombing the ski launch sites. These are 96 launching sites in France with storage bunkers and outdoor ramps like ski jumps, for launching the V-1 flying bomb, the new German secret weapon. Allied photo recon in November has actually spotted a pilotless plane on one of the ramps. Now on the 4th, the entire North French coast is re-photographed from the skies by the Allies to make sure they've identified all the sites and the bombing campaign begins the next day. The first bombings are done by USAAF Martin B-26 Marauders, RAF Bomber Command will soon begin night bombing of the sites, but the accuracy at night isn't so good, so the Joint Chiefs will send in heavy bombers by daylight. Peering into the future, seven sites will be destroyed by the end of 1943. And peering back to today, this week comes to an end. With political intrigue in Cairo, bloody allied attacks across Italy that grind out some gains, German advances in the USSR, and the bombing of the Marshall Islands. Oh, and on the 4th, Bolivia declares war on the Axis powers. I'm going to end today a bit differently, with a somewhat light-hearted anecdote for a change. One that I read in Martin Gilbert's The Second World War. On December 9th comes an escape from Germany. D.P. James, lieutenant in the Royal Navy, busts out of his POW camp and tries to reach the Baltic Sea. He is dressed somewhat remarkably, wearing his full British naval uniform on purpose with a card that claims to be a Bulgarian naval identity card. The name on the card is I Buggerov. Get it? Bugger off, bugger off, yeah. He is arrested this time before he can fully escape, but he will do the same escape next year and succeed, changing eventually to a Swedish sailor's outfit, boarding a Finnish ship at Danzig, and making his way safely to Stockholm. That is all. Stockholm is actually where I write all of these episodes. This endless chronicle of this, as far as I know, endless war. It is actually the Time Ghost Army that makes this series and War Against Humanity and Spies and Ties and On the Home Front and all the specials and everything else possible. So join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest commissioned officers and Kirsten Banuelos, Banuelos, Banuelos is the army member of the week. And thinking about special weapons and things that people think will win the war, check out the special we did on the Higgins boat last year. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.